Please come in, have a seat. It is time to get things going again. Now, as, as many of you are aware in selecting speakers for Residence Day, in the past, we invited people from outside and then someone had the bright idea that we have a lot of talent among our alumni. And so we select an alumnus of the year. And for 2022, honored at the Academy meeting last fall, our own uh, Majid Moshefar. Dr. Moshefar was a medical student at Georgetown, a resident at the University of Illinois. He did two fellowships here. He was a cornea and refractive surgery fellow. Then he stayed around for more as an anterior segment and uveitis fellow, finishing that in 1998. I was thrilled when he joined our faculty to take over cornea and refractive surgery. It was absolutely a, you know, a good move uh, for our patients. And uh, um, he worked with us until 2014. He left to be a professor at the Proctor Foundation in San Francisco. He came back and since returning to Salt Lake, um, he has uh, had a cornea and refractive surgery anterior segment practice uh, at Hoops Vision. He also has gone to the administrative side. He's the medical executive director at Lone Peak Hospital. And uh, it is uh, my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Moshefar to talk to us about some issues related to refractive surgery uh, this afternoon. Dr. Moshefar. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I think the reason I did two years was because after I finished the first year, they just said, you know, this guy is just not ready. And uh, uh, so we have to really keep him here. And then when I finished that, they still said, Dr. Olson said, this guy is not ready. We have to keep him here longer so we can teach him how to do things. Um, I'm so happy to be back uh, with my family. Moran is my family. Not a day goes uh, that I talk about Moran and the history uh, and all the great people here. And I'm humbled and honored uh, to be here when uh, Dr. Mifflin uh, called me last summer and uh, told me that, hey, Majid, we were wondering if you could be the distinguished uh, uh, alumni. And I said, well, are you sure? Uh, you know, because I always think of myself as a substandard talent. And I said, Mark, why me? And then he said, well, you know, I guess we couldn't find anyone better. I said, well, okay, because, you know, we have so many smart neuro ophthalmologists. We have smart retina specialists, glaucoma specialists, cataract surgeons. You know, refractive surgery kind of goes way down there. And you will see that when I start to talk, you see that it's pretty easy. Even a kindergarten kid can understand what I'm talking about. But I am humbled. I'm really humbled. And it's an honor to be here with great minds. And uh, I will try to talk, and it's wonderful. It's after lunch, so you can take a nap as I talk because it's not, it's not that uh, hard to understand what I'm going to say. Uh, I was going to go and talk about uh, my area of interest. And my area of interest by is primarily uh, femtosecond assisted lenticule implantation, basically the reverse of smile that people talk about. But then when I talk with my students, they all said, oh, come on, let's talk about something that we are doing. And I actually felt better. So what I'm going to talk about this next uh, uh, 45 minutes or so is primarily the stuff that my great students uh, have done just in the last five weeks. And three of them already submitted for publication. And after this, I'm going to meet the students and uh, work on three more manuscripts before 6 p.m. and send them out. So I, I'm not kidding you. And uh, I was telling Dr. Petty that my wife and my kids are the highlights of my life, but the students are truly the second highlight of my life. I never thought that I could find a passion um, and I'm lucky because I learned so much from them. Uh, on that note, uh, I wanted to tell you something when I found out that uh, Elaine and uh, Kelly, they put this picture up there. I called Lynn and I said, Lynn, why did they choose this picture? Why didn't you give them this other picture of mine? And then she said, well, Dr. Moshe, that picture belongs to 30 years ago. And I said, yeah, but I look better in that one. And he kind of looked at me and said, yeah. So on that note, I kind of knew that I'm getting old and I am old, but at the same time, I'm honored to be here to share my little knowledge, what I know, which is not much with great, great minds here. I have no financial interest, but 
Uh, yes, there are a couple of uh, FDA instruments that I am part of them that I'm doing right now for eligibility and feasibility that I will talk about, but I'm not getting any money personally or any personal check from these companies, including Johnson & Johnson and Alcon. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, mention Carter Payne, Devin Harvey, Michael Heron, David Shaw, Jack Wang, and also David West. These are the people who right now currently are working in our office, little office in Draper, and uh, I'm going afterwards to meet uh, David Cha. So I want to thank them because they are the ones who share their data with me. So I said, and I said to them that let's uh, present your data here to our other uh, research uh, uh, residents. And uh, Dr. Payne uh, uh, is our wonderful fellow who is finishing and going to Georgetown, George Washington. And uh, he's just a wonderful person, and I can't thank him enough for all the projects that we've done so far. Uh, the primary objective of this paper is to simply briefly talk about uh, a little overview of uh, lenticule extraction, uh, talk about the distribution of the refractive error and pupil in the refractive population, and primarily in Draper population, because that's what we see. And what is the corneal curvature changes after refractive surgery, whether it's LASIK or PRK, and compare them. And look at the optical zone. Is it really 6.5 or is it not really 6.5? Uh, and what sort of aberration is created by these different surgery, whether it's LASIK, whether it's SMILE? And lastly, uh, briefly talk about the relevance of this, if any. We all know about PRK, we know about LASIK, and uh, lenticule extraction, or what people call RELEX, is basically a femtosecond platform. And this RELEX or femtosecond platform that some people call SMILE basically uses a device, a femtosecond platform, to create two dissection in the cornea, anteriorly and a little bit deeper posteriorly. And these two dissections meet, and then they create a disc. And then you have this small incision, four, three, five, depending on who you're talking about. And then through that small incision, you remove this uh, the, uh, femtosecond assisted dissected lenticule. And depending on the power, can be for hyperopia, can be for myopia, can even be for mixed astigmatism. And it is called RELAX. Unfortunately, over time, this RELAX uh, terminology was coined SMILE. And the reason it was coined SMILE is because the platform was introduced in 2016. And that's what we have been using in the United States since 2017. And people call it small incision lenticule extraction. And that's because the company was a Zeiss company. Otherwise, this is really a RELAX. And we are actually have another laser platform that I am working with FDA right now. And we are in the feasibility stage. We've already done 30 some eyes with it. And it's called smooth incision lenticule keratomalusis. That's also RELAX. It's just another name for it. And that is what companies nowadays are doing. They're trying to confuse the scientific literature and everyone else by using different terminology. And then guess what? There's another one, Zimmer. Wonderful company, fantastic company. I really like them. They also have a platform called Zimmer that called C-L-E-A-R or CLEAR, Corneal Lenticule Extraction for Advanced Refractive Correction. These three procedures are identical by principle. They all use basically a femtosecond platform and they all do the same thing. This is one of the first cases that I did in 2017 the patient is actually fixating on the light on, on their own. And then you create a posterior dissection with a femtosecond bunch of bubbles. And then you're doing the anterior dissection, which is usually at the depth of 120 in the United States, but it can be as deep as 160 and as shallow as 100. And then that's the anterior dissection. And then eventually you do a incision. It can be superior, it can be inferior, it can be whichever direction you want to put it. And originally it was five millimeter. And this is actually one of the older videos of mine shows you the five millimeter incision. Now we're doing this through a three millimeter incision. It was easier to do it that way. And uh, the dissection requires some manual labor. That's where I do my workout. My wife says, you need to do more workout. I say, honey, this is my workout. This is the manual dissection that I do here. And then you do the posterior dissection. And eventually you take this lenticule out and these lenticules are uh, removed. Uh, and uh, we right now doing not, nothing, anything special with them, but I'm sure we did something with them. And uh, just to show you, this is the lenticule. We always look at it and we say it's pretty. And uh, 
Many times we just toss them out, uh, unfortunately. So, and then this is the other platform that we are working with Johnson & Johnson. And again, it's going through uh, two sites in the United States and it's called Silk. Again, it's the same thing, it's Relax. And uh, we are basically docking on the eye. The only difference with this Relax or this uh, platform is that you actually create the suction on the eye. The patient cannot fixate on the green light anymore. You are creating a suction the same way we do for LASIK. The vision gets dim. Once the vision is dim, you try to basically center uh, the, and you can see the ablation is different. You can see that the posterior dissection just done, then the, then the anterior dissection is done. And then you do the little tiny incision up there and that's it. And what is the advantage of this? Well, there is no advantage. This is just a patent that they developed for themselves. They can talk about the advantage of this versus the other one. And I don't want to get into that. That's beyond this talk, but this is another platform. And then once it's done, you basically uh, go ahead and you, uh, let me see if I can show this to you guys. Here I am marking the cyclotorsion of the eye before I put the uh, suction on the eye. In this one, you actually mark the pupil because the suction makes the vision dark. And as you all know, once you create a suction, the pupil becomes somewhat dilated and it goes through kind of a movement. That's why we mark them. And then this is afterwards, once the dissection is done. And again, similar concept. You really can't tell the difference between the smile from silk. They're both the same procedure. And you basically do the dissection. And then you remove the lenticule. And again, we look at the lenticule and we're hoping that one day we would be able to do some uh, work with this, perhaps with Dr. Mamelis's laboratory and Dr. Werner's laboratory, because you can actually see that this entity is really about six or 6.5, depending on what platform and what size you decided. And uh, sometimes they can be very thin um, and they are extremely thin. This, this thing here right now is about 70 micron. And you can actually see the imperfection of the lenticule and those semicircular pattern on this one, for example. And uh, this is another platform, again, clear platform. And in the clear platform, again, you're creating the suction on the surface. And again, you do the same thing over. And again, you take the lenticule out. And again, it's the same sort of a thing. So we have these three platforms that we use. Now, I wish, and I think I want to also thank uh, Dr. Bajogli, who is one of the pathology fellows here with Dr. Mamelis, who's working with uh, Dr. Payne on an editorial that we are writing right now for one of the journals that uh, really this is confusing to use different abbreviation for some, some procedure that is identical. And the angle we're taking that this is femtosecond assisted, and this is a keratomalusis procedure. And why don't we just call this a small incision LASIK because it still is keratomalusis, or why don't we just stick with a relax? Uh, and that's what we're trying to do right now. And in instead of letting uh, companies use their own trade names such as clear and silk and confuse the scientific literature when the procedure is really the same. Now, before I go any further to the optical part of our pay, uh, study here, I just wanted to ask uh, and see if uh, our residents kind of understand the importance of when we say we're doing a minus six uh, smile or a minus six LASIK, if we take that lenticule out and let's say we freeze it and then we put it underneath a lensometer, theoretically, what is the power of that lenticule? So I have a patient who's a minus six, I create that lenticule, which I just showed you, and I take that lenticule. If I put that lenticule theoretically underneath a lensometer, what is the power of this lenticule? What is it, guys? Very good. It's plus six. And that's why when you're evaporating the cornea, when you're doing a minus six eczema laser, and you can smell it in your nostrils, that is about plus six amount of stromal tissue as well. And here I'm showing you another one. It's a minus six, minus 150 axis 30. Yes.
we can talk about that afterwards. Yes, I'll talk with you about that when it comes to curvature changes. So when you do a minus six minus 150 axis 30, and if you do that on lensometer, what is the power of this one you think? Jordan, do you know? It is going to be plus six, plus 150 axis 30. Plus six, plus 150 axis 30. You just have to sit down and drive that in your head and you'll see why. And then it becomes in a minus cylinder plus 750 minus 150 axis 120. Now, I can also show you a, you a mixed astigmat and make things even more difficult. But this is the concept. And the reason I just chose to do the minus and myopic astigmatism is because the talk is primarily about myopia and myopic astigmatism and not hyperopic relax or mixed astigmatic relax. Now, when we're talking about the pupil size, we decided to look at a bunch of student uh, patients in the last six, seven weeks in Draper. And we said, let's go back and look and see if we can find all the data on our patients in an OPD scan machine and see if we can look at the distribution of the refractive error. Anyone who walks into the office, conjunctivitis, LASIK, uh, transplants, glaucoma, whatever. And we looked at all these patients who had specifically OPD scan because with the OPD scan, you can look at the mesopic and photopic pupil. You can also look at the refractive error you can also look at the change in the size of the pupil over time because it's more dynamic. So basically, based on that, we looked at about 1,400 eyes. And yes, it was almost 50-50 male. And we noticed that there were about almost 8% high myopes over the six diopters. And less than 5% of the patients were mixed astigmats. That means these were patients who were almost plano spherical equivalent. And about 15% were hypero. Now, remember, these are not only refractive screening patients. These are patients who just come to us to see us. And this is really reflective of what's in the literature too. If you look at the literature from Germany or other places that have done some big demographic on that. Now, what's interesting, we also noticed that there were 2.8% keratoconics. And I remember there was a point that we thought that keratoconus was one in 10,000, then they changed it to one in 2,000. Then they start saying that, no, 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 keratoconus can be sometimes 0.3%. And now there are some papers that even say it could be 1%. I said the incidence of keratoconus is 1, 162 sometime in the past. And I was uh, kind of attacked by that. But I truly, truly think that the incidence of keratoconus, if you include subclinical keratoconus, it is a lot more than what people think. And so many times you do cataract surgery, the cataract surgeons in the group here, that you look at that topography on a 90-year-old and you see that steep cornea and a thin cornea and you say, oh, this lady did have keratoconus. It's just that the diagnosis is a lot less noted than it really is. So I truly think that there is almost three out of 100 people walking the streets of Draper who have just subtle keratoconus. We looked at the pupil size. This is nothing all of you guys know that. That as the age increases per decade, the size of your pupil gets smaller, whether it's mesopic or photopic. Nothing extraordinary about that. But then if you look at the normal distribution, looking at the young blue bars here versus the older patients like myself, the maroon color, you can see that there is this shift from the left to the right on the diagram here, that shows you that the pupil sizes actually get smaller as you get older, whether it's mesopic or photopic. Linear regression, nothing into it. It simply shows you that as you get older, closer to 100, we had a bunch of patients who were in their 90s, and we had a couple of patients who were there six and seven years old. And look at this data, and out of these uh, uh, patients, we noticed that, yeah, definitely the pupil uh, get, gets smaller as you get older. Again, I love this because I think this is a hard work of one student and he, he deserves to have his data shown here. Same thing here, refractive error. The more hyperopic you become, plus nine versus minus 21, the pupil sizes also get smaller too. Now we can sit here and talk about accommodation and all that stuff. But overall, the gist of it is in that this big cohort, the size of the pupil definitely 
became smaller as the refractive error became more hyperopic. We looked at a control group and we wanted to know, okay, if you look at just refractive error, can we really say age match if the pupil sizes are larger for myopes always more than the hyperopes? Yes, the pupil sizes are statistically larger for the myopes versus the hyperopes and mixed astigma, but there is no difference between the mixed astigmats and the hyperopes. Same thing with the angle kappa. For the pediatric ophthalmologists here, they know angle kappa is a big deal, and we know that the angle kappa is always associated with hyperopia. But when it comes to higher the myopia is, the level of angle kappa gets less and less and less. And that's what you see on the pentacam. The higher the myopia is, the less the angle kappa is, and the closer the vertex of the cornea is going to be with respect to the center of the pupil. And here we're simply showing that again, that there is definitely a correlation in terms of the photopic mesopic pupil size and the level of sphere. I love this one because this is what we need for topography guided LASIK. When we do topography guided LASIK, the fact is topography is always going to be on the vertex or the line of sight or the vertex of the cornea. The contour is not going to be theoretically on this pupil. And what we are showing you is that there is still a dynamic phenomenon is happening. The mesopic pupil versus a photopic pupil, it always moves more toward the nose and also slightly superior. So that means when your pupil constricts, you actually have a centroid shift in the dynamics of your pupil. And this is nicely demonstrated here that it becomes more nasal and slightly superior. Now, what's interesting is that this was a big deal when we were doing RK. I did mini RK uh, when I was here, fellow with Dr. Clinch. And we actually went to Dr. Casebeer for two weeks to get a workshop with that too. And we did RK, mini RK, and we always made a big deal about putting pilocarpine in the eye to make the pupil smaller. And every time we put that pilocarpine, the pupil always would move toward the nose more. This is a real thing. So there is a centroid shift that happens. And the higher the aberration. For those of you who are interested in cataract surgery, uh, I'm not a cataract surgeon, but in the cataract surgery, you can see that prior to the cataract surgery, these patients haven't had cataract surgery yet. You can see that the patients who undergo cataract intraocular lens, the level of HOA, whether it's internal, whether it's external, or whether it's total, it's slightly more than the younger people who are undergoing your common LASIK PRK and SMILE. And then look at the keratoconic eyes. Of course, they have a high amount of higher order aberration. But what I like about this slide is that the higher order aberration in keratoconic patient is not just in the cornea, guys. You can see that the patients with a higher order aberration externally that have keratoconus, they also have higher amount of higher order aberration internally. And you know why? Because it neutralizes their vertical coma. Their lens accommodates with a very nice zonular form, not in a very regular form. So you can have a keratoconic patient that has a significant inferior cone, but can use his lens to neutralize the higher order aberrations of the cornea. So you can have an internal higher order aberration to neutralize your external higher order aberration as shown here. Lastly, I just wanted to show you, this is something that we all have seen. The older you get, the more against the rule stigmatism you become. And this is shown nicely here. When you're not young, almost 70% of your patients have with the rule stigmatism. And when we become old like me, it's almost 51% have against the rule stigmatism. Now we looked at this group and I didn't want to get too much into it because we have other stuff to talk about. But when we looked, we wanted to see if these against the rule stigmatisms are always lenticular because we thought, oh, older people get against the rule of stigmatism because it's mainly lenticular. No, these patients still had many of them against the rule of stigmatism on their cornea, as well as the against the rule of stigmatism in their lens. Corneal curvature. We all know about the total corneal curvature in a normal person. It's about what, 42, 43, 45 diopters. What about the radius of curvature? We all know it's about 7.8. Um, those people who do contact lenses are quite familiar with this radius of curvature. That's how you, you know what, uh, what sort of a lens you should pop on the patient's cornea. 
But what about posterior curvature? That's the nebulous area that when I was a fellow, nobody even told me about posterior corneal curvature. You guys know about posterior corneal curvature uh, much more than when I was uh, an attending. And the posterior corneal curvature, the, what is the usual radius of curvature of a posterior cornea? So a 6.4. Now, many people don't talk about posterior ratio to the anterior ratio, but the PA is extremely important for the cataract surgeons who want to do cataract surgery on patients. And nobody talks about the PA ratio, but that's the ratio of 6.4 over 7.8 that I will get to in a second. And what is the diopter of the posterior curvature? You know that a lot because you do a lot of toric IOLs. What is the posterior curvature of the cornea in diopters, guys? It's about minus six point. That's the posterior corneal curvature, all right? So this is very important later on when we talk about changes in the corneal curvature, especially anteriorly and also posteriorly after LASIK surgery or SMILE. So what, we, what happens when you shave off the cornea? What happens when you basically take that cornea and burn it down with 40, 60, 100 micron? You flatten the cornea. What do you mean by that? You increase the radius of the curvature. You take that curvature from 7.8 millimeter to 8.6, 8.2 millimeter. And that's why their power of their cornea goes from 45 diopters all of a sudden to 39 diopters. So you actually reduce the power of the cornea by changing that radius of curvature. But that radius of the curvature change, you all know is not one to one. When you do six diopters of correction on somebody's cornea, you are not going to make that cornea six diopters flatter. That ratio is not one to one. I wish it was, but it's not. And that's because you're only looking at the anterior corneal curvature. You're not looking at the posterior corneal curvature. And you also don't think of other factors that are involved, which is right now beyond the scope of this talk. But we will talk a little bit about this ratio because this ratio is something that we all take for granted, but it is extremely important because if you are doing a patient who's minus 10 versus a patient who's minus one, the delta change of your corneal curvature per diopter of a change of that cornea when you burn it or you cut it or you do whatever with it, that ratio is not the same. This was a paper that we wrote in 2012 at Moran Eye Center on almost 3,000 uh, patients. And we showed that this ratio for LASIK patient was about 0.7 to 0.8. It's a known fact now in the world that the cornea changes by about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 diopters. And we also showed that that changes based on the microkeratome versus femtosecond, if you do contoura, if you don't do wavefront, if you do wavefront optimize, and we showed all that. And this was a, a slide that people use all over the country and everywhere else. This was one of the first ones that showed that as the spherical equivalent correction increases, if you're doing somebody who's minus seven or eight versus somebody who's about minus one or two, the ratio goes down and it goes down almost toward 0 0.7, 0 0.8. And this ratio, when it comes to minus one and minus two and even less, it's even more noisy. So we looked at this ratio and we wanted to know if this ratio was any different between the patients, whether you get LASIK or PRK. So what did we do? We decided to choose patients who were happy they were happy with their correction. You wanted them to be minus five, they were minus five. You wanted to reduce the cylinder from minus one to minus one, you did that. So these patients did not undergo enhancement. These patients had one year follow-up, not three months. And we looked at these patients' tomographies and looked at their keratometries and looked at the achieved correction, which was basically emetropization. And we wanted to know if these patients had the same ratio. And looking at them based on one-year data to preoperative data, we showed that the ratio for these patients based on this number of eyes and this demographic here, what is that ratio? One thing we identified when we looked at these patients we noticed that, well, first of all, the higher order aberration was higher in the PRK group. Second of all, the PRK groups had a steeper cornea 
and the SMILE group had a higher level of myopia, well, these groups are not the same. But at the same time, we realize that there is always a selection bias. Patients who are PRK usually thinner. That's why the pachymetry is thinner. Patients who usually get PRK usually have inferior steepening. Patients who get SMILE usually are higher myopes. So this inherent selection bias was controlled later on in the study to ana analyze further stuff for us. But in terms of the common ground, you know, typical 20, 20, 20, 30, safety efficacy, this is the nine standard graph that every journal asks us to do. When we looked at the nine standard graph, predictability, line of correction, best line of correction, everything was very similar except astigmatism, which was noisier for the smile. Otherwise, in terms of safety efficacy, efficacy index, and everything else, all three platforms were very similar. But it wasn't the course of the study to look at that standard treatment because people have done that. We wanted to look at the delta K change per spherical equivalent for LASIK versus PRK versus SMILE. And what we noticed that, yeah, LASIK still is somewhere around 0.8-ish, but we noticed that the SMILE was lower than LASIK. And this, even if you normalize the group, which we did, still revealed that for some odd reason, when you're trying to do a minus eight on a smile, you cannot make that cornea the same flatness that you can in a LASIK. And we think that has to do with the fact that this ratio is lower because maybe the cornea is not being dissected as I think Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Stagg was asking, maybe because the cornea inferiorly is not intruded, maybe because the Bowman is intact. And by having the Bowman intact and not damaging that anterior 120 micron of the cornea and not making 11 uh, hour of cut, uh, maybe these corneas are inferiorly stronger. And maybe that's why the ratio was different. We did correlation studies, age. We tried to see if there was a factor of age. Yes, there was some correlation between age and the change in the ratio. We did notice that, and that is not something new, but we noticed that that ratio was present not only for LASIK, but also for SMILE. And we noticed that this ratio gets less as you get older. And what does that mean? What does that mean if the patient gets older and the ratio gets smaller? That means if you want to correct somebody for two diopters, you don't need to do two diopters on an old person. You do 1.6. On the other hand, if you want to do two diopter on a young person, you need to do 2.1. That's what this tells you. That's all. What about looking at pachymetry? Really no real correlation that we could find that was statistically uh, important or different between the groups. Preoperative pachymetry didn't show anything. We also looked at keratometry. Yes, there was some correlation between the pre-op K and the ratio. And this correlation that we identified was more obvious in LASIK, but not in PRK and not in SMILE. And again, that means if you have a steeper cornea and you do LASIK on them versus PRK and SMILE, they may behave differently. And we did look at the total correction. And this is granted, the higher the correction, the lower the ratio, the lower the correction, the bigger the ratio. So when you are doing only minus one or two, the ratio should be closer to one. And when you're doing minus eight, the ratio should be minus 0.79. So it should be less. Which also indicates that because the ratio goes lower, when you're doing a minus eight, you can reduce your nomogram and do maybe minus 7.25. That's what this shows you, regardless of age. And this is the importance of delta K, delta SEQ, not just for cataract surgeon. This is important for refractive surgeons to have a nomogram. Every surgeon should have their own nomogram. And we also looked at the cylinder and the cylinder that we only found was that there is a, some correlation between smile and cylinder. And we think this has to do with the fact that smile still cannot correct cylinder as good as LASIK and PRK because of lack of nomogram and because of the limitation of its range. So when it comes to cylinder, our correlation shows that there is under correction. So in summary, what we found, yes, there is about a 
LASIK has a highest, higher rate of ratio, SMILE has the lowest ratio, and the flatter the cornea is, the higher the ratio, and the older you are, the higher the ratio. And the higher the correction that you're doing, you need the lower ratio, so you need to ablate the cornea less. And has this been published? Not exactly in this form for SMILE. We also wanted to look at posterior corneal curvature for those cataract surgeons in the group. How much change do you see in the posterior corneal curvature? We talked about the posterior corneal radius. We talked about anterior corneal radius. We said the anterior corneal radius is about 7.8, 7.6. Posterior corneal radius we talked about was about 6.5, 6.3. If you do that ratio, what is the ratio of the eye? This is something that I hoping that today the residents take with them home, if you start doing for average Joe, young person PA ratio who doesn't have keratoconus, whether you're myope, whether you're hyperope, whether you are mixed astigmat, what is the ratio? I want you guys to remember this because PA ratio is very important. Not for me, but for you guys eventually when you do cataract surgery. So. We looked at it. So we looked at this ratio and we wanted to know, okay, we go, we burn this, we shave this, we dissect this, and we make this flatter. So we increase the radius of curvature. So by increasing the radius of the curvature, the PA ratio, which is the posterior anterior ratio, of course goes down. And then we said, well, let's look at it. And we look at this very crowded uh, graph here. And we showed that all these ratios, which were like 0.8, 0.8, boom, they all go down, they go to 0 0.7, 0 0.8, boom, goes down to 0 0.7. Same thing for SMILE. All three of them, all three platform behave the same way when it comes to change in the ratio after surgery for a myopic, myopic astigmatic correction. And they were not any different from one another. So the change in the ratio after you zap, cut, whatever, is very similar. Now, this is not the case for RK. We're not gonna talk about that. That's another talk by itself. Now, what about the curvature of the back? Remember we talked about the posterior curvature being minus 6.5, 6.4, 6.3. Okay, now you take this cornea, you make it oblate, you make it look like a frog cornea. Okay, what happens to the posterior corneal curvature? The posterior corneal curvature becomes less myopic. The minus 6.2 becomes minus 6.15. The minus 6.1 becomes minus 6.0. There is a decline so becomes less myopic. But the change is not impressive, but there is still a change in the curvature. So the back of the cornea becomes slightly flatter, but nothing like the anterior curvature. And many of you say, oh, come on, 6.15 minus from minus 6.2. Is that a big deal? You're absolutely right, is not a big deal. But for some patients that you are doing the calculation for a axial length of 25 millimeter, and now their case anteriorly is 39. This can impact the calculation by three to 4%. You can actually have the power of the lens change by half a diopter. So posterior corneal curvature change, even though it becomes less myopic, meaning that it still becomes more flat and oblate shape, still has a very subtle impact on some patients. What about Q value, asphericity? Well, you guys do cataract surgery all the time, and you guys put all those, you know, lenses that have uh, asphericity in them and the Q value. Oh, I like Technus. I like this lens. I don't know because you know I always talk about that, right? And you always say, oh, "What's the Q value of that lens? What's the Q value of this one? Oh, this one has this Q value. That one has that Q value. That Q value is important because of this." And I'm going to show you that in a second. What is the Q value of a normal person? who has a normal cornea and doesn't have a flat frog cornea. This is a flat frog cornea. This is an eagle cornea, which is beautifully prolate. Well, this cornea, of course, if it gets too bad, then it's a keratoconic cornea. This cornea is more minus, and this cornea is more plus. And that is based on this AB ratio that people use. That's why it's a ratio, guys. And the more a cornea is prolate, the negative it is, and the more cornea frog and oblate it is, it's more positive. And what you are seeing here, again, is the posterior Q value. The posterior Q value of the cornea is minus 0.31, but what is the anterior one? 
it's very similar. It's about minus 0.26. So the Q value anteriorly and posteriorly is minus. What happens when we do LASIK or PRK on these patients? What happens to this Q value, Jordan? So here you are, pre-post, 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 pre-post. Anteriorly, you go from minus 0.3-ish to almost plus 0.5 something, 0.3 to plus 0.5. So you see this change. That is why when you see these patients 20 years later, they had their LASIK, thanks to me. Now they come to you, they have to have their cataract surgery done. And you are saying, oh, I'm going to put a lens I'm going to use Johnson & Johnson lens or that other lens because the Q value is minus 0.2 something. You are trying to bring this Q value down. That is the reason. And these are the patients that had surgery a year ago. So you can see that the Q value definitely goes up. The asphericity becomes more plus. But nobody talks that much about the Q value of the posterior cornea. And there is a change even in the Q value of the posterior aspect of the cornea. And I'm just sh simply showing it here in this, is in this thing, in this, uh, with the magnitudes. And I'm showing that there is a change. So the posterior asphericity definitely increases both in LASIK and SMILE compared to the preoperative Q value. We tried to do a multivariable analysis to see if we can come up with a model. Can we really guess what the PA ratio is going to be if everything goes nice and dandy if the patient doesn't go blind and they don't get a flap dislocation or ingrowth and you do a minus five, can we really predict the PA ratio afterwards? Well, you know, I have to tell you something about multilinear regression. You can use a multilinear regression and the students do it all the time. You can correlate the change in the refractive error after my LASIK surgery to my neighbor's golf course scores and all that. So I just want you to know, you need to look at multivariable regression with some, some skepticism, but definitely the PA ratio depends on the total amount of correction and also the pre-op and age and the posterior cornea. So the posterior cornea definitely has a factor here. And then if you look at the PRK, again, correction, age, and pre-op value has a factor there. And lastly, smile again, the level of correction, pre-op pre-value, posterior Q value, and age. So you cannot ignore the posterior Q value and the pre-op PA value, but age and the level of correction has a major impact on it as well. Now, remember I told you that if you look at the anterior curvature, and put the patient on the uh, good old Bosch and Lomb keratometer, or just look at the sagittal curvature, the ratio is not one-to-one. -one. We talked about it. We said that if you do 44 diopter patient and you do four diopter, they're not going to become 40. They're going to still be like 42 point something. Why is that? Well, we wanted to come up with a better predictor. What if there is a better way to make sure that it's really one-to-one -one prediction? If somebody is really getting a six diopter correction, is there a map on that Pentacam machine that I can look that really tells me it's minus six? Is there a map that I can find that's not tangential, that's not posterior? Can I use a map that tells me that if I'm doing a minus eight diopter correction, I can see that minus eight almost on the surface of the cornea before and after surgery? Well, we looked at difference maps. We looked at difference maps with Pentacam. We looked at the difference map of anterior sagittal curvature. This is what we do all the time. We looked at the difference map of refractive power. We looked at the difference map of true net power. We looked at the difference map of TCRP. Now, many of you have done cataract surgery on post-LASIK patients, and you go to the ASCRS IOL calculator. Remember that TNP you see there? And it says 4.0 millimeter optical apex zone or pupil zone. Well, people have looked into that for many years. So we looked at that, and we wanted to find the best predictor for that. Which one of them is the best one? Well, I tell you this right now. For high corrections, mainly these two, but I'm going to show it to you. So we wanted to look and see if diopter for diopter of correction, which one of these different maps before surgery and one year after surgery really predicted almost to the T the correction. And we use this machine. You are all familiar with these different maps that you can get. This is a very useful tool. 
If you use this, you can actually get different display with different type of maps. So we used it for those four that I just showed you. And we looked at them. We looked at the sagittal curvature pre and post. We looked at refractive power pre and post. We looked at true net pre and post. And we also looked at total corneal power pre and post. And what we came up with was that indeed for LASIK and PRK and SMILE, when you could compare these and stratify them based on the level of myopia that they had before surgery, which one can give you almost 99% or 95% great prediction. And we came up with this very crowded graph here for you. So I'm gonna go through that. Blue one, just look at the blue and the green here. The blue and the greens are the TCRPs and the TNPs. And what you see here is that they are a lot closer to the zero, which means that we were really right on in terms of predicting the correction for LASIK, PRK, and SMILE across the board compared to the sagittal one and compared to the refractive power one. So that's why you can never use your sagittal from your lens star or from your IO master to predict for you because those are really not going to give you what the true net power uh, and CCRP is going to give you because the, those two are including the posterior curvature. Those are looking at your you know, collective power change. We looked at the high myopes again, they do a lot better than these two other ones. So TCRP and TNP were better. We did the same thing for moderate myope, which were between minus three and six. We see the same thing. But then when it comes to low myopes, remember that old graph I showed you from 2012 paper of mine? It becomes all over the place. And that's where if you're dealing with a low myope, we should still go back to the good old sagittal because we think the sagittal is better for LASIK and PRK. What about SMILE? We don't have enough data to give you. Most of our patients were high, high myopes and moderate myopes. So we don't know anything about the SMILE right now to tell you, but nobody is doing a minus one and a minus half with SMILE. Most of them are three and four. But for uh, low myopes, PRK and LASIK, still sagittal and refractive power, which is mainly based on the anterior curvature, will get you by. So in summary, we noted that LASIK TNP at five millimeter, PRK TNP at five millimeter was the best, but not for SMILE. It was TCRP at four millimeter, not pupil, apex, which now takes me to another talk. So this apex business is very important. When you do RK versus PRK versus LASIK, if you ever wanna do calculation, you have to look at these factors. And for LASIK and PRK, it's five millimeter pupil zone. But for SMILE, for some reason, it's apex, not the center of the pupil. And I'll get to that in a second for you guys. And this is simply showing you the correlation was very tight for these LASIK and SMILE and for uh, LASIK and PRK. And for SMILE, it's actually good. It's just that we have less number of patients. Now let's talk about effective optical zone, because that's where we're talking about vertex versus a, apex versus the uh, pupil size, uh, pu 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 pupil measurement. When, when you use, I think you guys use the great platform here, EX500 laser, which is usually programmed for 6.5 millimeter, but you blend to nine millimeter. Well, if you do that, you think you're getting 6.5 millimeter, but you're not, we're not, none of us are. And the fact is that the actual zone that you get is a lot less. And why is, is that important? That's because some of your patients may have large pupil. And what happens if you do a too much of a correction? Uh, one of my friends was asking me, what's wrong with trying to do a eight millimeter ablation zone or eight millimeter lenticule for a smile? And I said, that's because you have to remove a lot of tissue. It's tissue hungry. And then what if you do too much, too small? Like we used to do, here, I remember at Moran, we used to do with the Summit Apex Plus, when I was a fellow, 4.5 millimeter optical zone with no transition. 4.5 millimeter optical zone with no transition. And now we're doing 6.5 with nine millimeter transition. So what happens if you do too small? Decentration, glare, halo, coma, trefoil, everything. And what about if it's not centered? that even causes more irregular astigmatism and oblique astigmatism. So we wanted to look, and what we did, we looked at those difference maps, and we tried to see if we could guesstimate 
the actual size of the ablation and you know, vertically and horizontally. And we did that. And we tried to use both tangential and the TCRP map in order to guess the ovality and the size of this 6.5 millimeter optical zone. And we found out that no, it's not 6.5, but also it's not to my surprise, four or five. It was still better than that. And I'm showing it to you here that for LASIK and PRK, when we are doing a 6.5 millimeter zone, in reality, you're getting somewhere between 6.2 and 5.9 because sometimes they're oval. And for PRK, it's about 6.1 to 5.7. But for SMILE, it was a lot better. And that's because you're actually creating a lenticule and you're excising it and you're taking it out. You're not chafing just in the corners. And for SMILE, the optical zone was actually bigger. You can see that, that the actual optical zone here was this red one. And if you compare that to the program one, this was the program optical zone, and this is the actual optical zone. And for LASIK was the blue one, which was the program one, and this is the actual optical zone. This is showing us that SMILE gives you a better optical zone. Yes, the effective optical zone, which I like to call it true optical zone, in SMILE is larger than LASIK and PRK, but for between LASIK and PRK, there is no difference. This is the next finding concerning the SMILE and LASIK. Remember I showed you that when we do the SMILE relax procedure, SMILE specifically patient is fixating. And if you look here, the red is the SMILE, and it always looks more nasal and superior, more nasal and superior. Whereas the PRK and LASIK, they're very centered overall with respect to the center. Now, this is showing you that when you are doing a smile, everything is with respect to the line of sight. We think the line of sight is closer to the vertex of the cornea. That's not really true, but that's the best demonstration here. That is why in smile, everything is always more nasal and a little bit more superior. Remember that centroid shift I showed you when the patient is sitting underneath that laser and they're nervous and they're looking at that green light and it's blinking and you're docking that thing on their eyes and you're telling them to look at the light. They're always a little bit more nasal and up because they are centered with respect to the vertex. Whereas in PRK and LASIK, they, are, they can be looking a little bit off, but you are tracking the pupil. And by tracking the pupil, you are always on the pupil center. Therefore, it looks more like that. And where is the real problem uh, thing is that maybe it's somewhere between these two. That's where the line of sight is. That's why it looks more decentered with respect to one versus the other. So in another word, smile is decentered superiorly and nasally, and LASIK is decentered inferiorly and temporally. The biggest higher order aberrations that we need to know about is coma, trafoil, and spherical aberration. But I still think it's only spherical aberration and coma. I do not think trafoil is a big deal. And I'll explain that to you in a second. Too crowded, but all I'm trying to show you is that this is the paper that we just submitted on higher order aberration. And we showed that the higher order aberration change is statistically significant the larger, the, the smaller the area is meaning that the correlation is negative. If the area of your treatment is bigger, your higher order aberration is smaller. Well, that's of course the case. If you have a nine millimeter optical zone, you're not gonna have any spherical aberration. If you can put a lens inside somebody who has cataract surgery and it's nine millimeter optical zone, I wish we could, the spherical aberration most likely would be less. And that's because the larger the area is, the less the higher order aberration. And this is nicely shown for all of them in, his, in this diagram. And what I'm saying, showing here is that if your area of treatment is smaller, your aberrations are a lot more. And if your area is bigger, your aberration is a lot less. And that's correlated primarily with spherical aberration, which is primarily the Q value, which is why you always want to, in cataract surgery, change that. It was not correlated with these values to a great extent. And that's what we show. 
that the smaller the optical zone, the larger the higher order aberration was. And this induction can cause mainly by your, uh, what we call the Z4 uh, on the aberration system. We wanted to look at these and everyone talks about smile causing more aberration or LASIK is causing more aberration. And we really wanted to look at that too in our own little center, so we did. And we see that yes, total aberration goes up, goes up, goes up. Now I remember when I used to do Summit Apex Plus, we didn't have these devices, but because our optical zone was only 4.5, and we thought the patients seeing 20, 30 should be grateful. I don't know why they're complaining. Because we increased the total higher order aberration by 11 folds, that's 1100%. We increased it for them from going from, remember we talked about aberration being 0.3 for young people, 0.4. We would take that to 1.8, 2.8 sometimes. That's because our ablations were only 4.5. But look here with our new platforms. And I think that this platform is the EX500, which is exactly like the one you have up there. Your aberration increases maybe by 80%, 90%, maybe it doubles, but it's not more than that but it is not less because they are trying to claim to you that your higher order aberration is diminished after Contura or after LASIK or after PRK. And that is not the case, but the induction is a lot less than ever before. What about SMILE? SMILE also increased the high order aberration, despite the fact that the effective optical zone was bigger. Spherical aberration, same thing, almost goes up. I'm not gonna say exactly doubles, but it goes up by about somewhere 50 to 80%. And the coma, lastly here shown that there is an increase in the coma for PRK and LASIK, but not for SMILE. The horizontal coma goes down in SMILE. You know why? Because the patient is actually looking and you're closer to the vertex. That is why there is an advantage sometimes because there is a decline in the vertical coma, in the horizontal coma. What about the vertical coma? Vertical coma doesn't increase, actually becomes in a magnitude different in a different direction. But the coma, there is an increase for LASIK. There is some decrease, but you have to understand this does not mean it's a bad thing, but for PRK it did not change. So is there a big deal that vertical coma or horizontal coma changes so Differently. Yes, it is. It is indeed a concern, but you have to also understand that vertical coma can be in a different direction and the horizontal coma can be in a different direction. So the magnitude can change and it can be advantageous. Trefoil. It's very difficult to say trefoil by itself has any clinical value. Why? Because when you look at the coma or spherical aberration, we're talking about 0.3 micron. 0.25 micron difference. But when you're talking about trefoil, whether it's oblique or horizontal, we're talking 0 0.03, 0 0.02, 0 0.01 changes. That is clinically may not be so tangible to us at this point. So we really can't say much about it. Why am I showing this crowded bar graph to you? Because I wanna show you that if you look in this side, horizontal comma, oblique trefoil, horizontal trefoil are really clinically not that relevant. But if you look here, spherical aberration and vertical coma is quite relevant in terms of the magnitude of microns. So you can see that the spherical aberration goes and the coma also changes. But the rest is not as important. Simply showing you that the higher the myopia, higher the higher order aberration, showing you that if your asphericity is in sync with your high order aberration, spherical aberration, yes, it is completely linearly coordinated. That's why the bigger the plus Q value is, the bigger the SA is going to be. So in summary, we can say that the change in the Q value and the spherical aberration are really correlated. And we can also say that the ratio of the spherical change to the high order aberration is very, nicely correlated. That's why higher myopes have higher aberration. In conclusion, yes, pupil size and age have correlation. We talked about the spherical error. We talked about angle kappa. 
We talked about the fact that the refractive error has an impact on them. We talked about the fact that keratometry, but age and cylinder and attempted correction can affect the, the ratio of change in keratometry. We also talked about the fact that having a nomogram would make a difference because of that ratio. And we also talked about different map differences that can have better predictability, especially TCRP and TNP. And with the fact that the effect of optical zone, it is definitely more in sync with what the reality is. And the best way is to look at the, not the TCRP map, but the tangential map. And remember that SMILE truly gives you a larger effective optical zone. But the PRK and LASIK are very similar, despite the fact that there is epithelial remodeling. The induction of the vertical coma and the higher order aberration in SMILE is a little bit more than LASIK and PRK. And this could be due to the fact that we are looking at the center of the vertex of the cornea, not the center of the pupil. And that may be the reason the numbers look different because most of the aberrometers are with respect to the pupil. If the aberrometers were with respect to the center of sight or the vertex, maybe the numbers would have looked totally the other way. The take home message is this, that I want the residents to respect posterior corneal curvature. I hope that they know what the PA ratio is in normal people. And I hope that they know that this ratio changes with time and also with refractive surgery. And yes, it is important to remember that it's not about just the effective lens position that everyone talks about in cataract surgery, but also the PA ratio after refractive surgery. And that's how sometimes people can get, can get hyperopic surprise. And I wanna thank you all for listening to me and I'm sorry it was not a very interesting talk, but I think it's important to have a good refresher on these things sometimes. Thank you. Yes, Amy. All right, well, I wanna applaud you for uh, your, you and your students' analysis of a lot of numbers. But I think earlier in your talk, you had uh, mentioned that you see less flattening of the keratometry values in SMILE compared to LASIK and PRK. So do you see more myopic regression with SMILE? No, I do not see myopic regression with SMILE. Um, and that is the amazing thing. If you look at the patients who have had their treatment done, so the question was, is there more regression with SMILE than with LASIK? No, there is no regression with SMILE compared to the others. The reason people are undercorrected is because of me, because I don't have a good nomogram. If I had a better nomogram as a surgeon, then I would have known how to compensate for that. You have to understand that the anterior corneal 120 micron or more is untouched with LASIK. And if anything, the posterior corneal curvature, even though changes just like LASIK and PRK, it changes less. And the epithelial hyperplasia is a lot less than PRK. So you can't say the regression that we see, patient comes back six months after lace, after smile for a minus seven and they're minus one, that's regression. No, it's because Moshify didn't have a good normal. That is the reality, in my opinion. Ooh, maybe there it comes. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, I might've missed this in all your data um, and you may have looked at this, but one thing I've always wondered about SMILE is do the stromal layers truly collapse down and create zero space after you take that lenticule out? Did you see pachymetric changes that you felt you should have seen with the level of ablation pattern as well um, as you looked at your data? This is, a, this is a very, very good question. Is there a collapse in that potential space? There's a potential space there. That potential space is not gonna go anywhere you know, until I die most likely. So that potential space there is forever, right? And the way we have to think about it is that if you have a pita bread and you go in there and you take the dough out and you let the anterior lamellae and the posterior lamellae collapse on one another, is there, first of all, some remodeling there? I assure you there is remodeling, especially in the periphery, especially where that annulus of cut is. And yes, I'm sure people are gonna look at this with confocal and everything else to show what's happening there. 
And our people have already done that, by the way. Some of them has been done on rabbit models and all that. There is a collapse. That's why there is even some striae. But the problem is those collapse are more tangible in those double digits and high corrections that surgeons like me do without having any respect for the cornea. Meaning that if you're doing a minus 13 diopters, of course, you're going to cause a major gap. And sometimes you actually can see it in the periphery. But if you're doing a minus two or three with these platforms, and by the way, there's a subtle difference between these companies, you may not see that. So my answer to you is that, yes, there is a potential space. Yes, there is remodeling. And as I think it was Dr. Stack who said something about uh, that dissection, is there some cutting in that periphery? And I also think we shouldn't be so happy go with creating larger flaps because uh, larger caps, because some of these platforms, you can make a nine millimeter cap and you have a lot more wiggle room in there to do your business. I think when you are dissecting the cornea way out like that, you are also affecting the risk of ectasia. And I still don't think we can say that there is no ectasia with smile. Absolutely disagree with that. And I still think that we are seeing some posterior corneal curvature sometimes on those corrections that Moshifa shouldn't have done a minus 12. And I did a minus 12 because I wasn't thinking right. So the answer to your question is, yes, there is a collapse of tissue. Yes, there is a potential. Yes, there is remodeling. But I think those are more tangible in higher level of corrections. Just one more question. I first saw Smile, I think it was 2018 or 2019 at a meeting in India, and, and I left there thinking what, what unique attributes this has that would you know, make a refractive surgeon in the U.S. want to adopt this. And so if you were projecting forward five to 10 years, you know, what percentage of refractive surgeons do you think will be offering this on the whole across the country? Do you think it will just be something at you know, major, larger centers? Mm -hmm. um, still trying to really understand what, what the unique uh, niche, niches for this uh, in the market? It's, I'm sure you all heard the question. Is Smile ever going to capture the lion of refractive surgery, which is still LASIK? I have to tell you this because I remember LASIK in its infancy and I saw the trajectory. And right now I am doing a study, one eye contour, one eye smile. And I'm also doing another study, one eye silk, one eye conventional, good old LASIK. And every day Carter sees these patients, 2015, 2012, in the contour eye or the regular conventional LASIK eye. The other eye, 2025, 2020, sometimes 2030 the first day. Week one later, a little bit better. Week four, a little bit better. Month three, he just showed me a patient, 2012, 2012. Now think about it, four years into SMILE, and we're already seeing 20 over 12 and 20 over 15. And that is not fair. We are comparing a toddler, a four-year-old, five-year-old toddler to a 20-year-old mature kid who has all the whistles on it. LASIK has everything. LASIK has psychotorsion, iris registration, beautiful femtosecond bubble uh, integrity. We still dilly dallying with the energy on SMILE. We're still dilly dallying with the energy on silk and clear. So the answer to your question is right now, hands down, LASIK is the pretty thing in the market, but smile with time, or I should say relax with time is going to take over. But internationally, I truly think that having one machine and not an excited dimer laser and a femtosecond, but one machine to do everything, it's so much better. And also from a mechanical point of view, when patients go home with smile, I don't have to worry about them as much. But with LASIK, you still have to worry about once in a blue moon, somebody having flaps to dislocation. But the answer to your question is, when is that? I think some people will adopt to it 100% with time. But in my hand, I still think that there are patients that I will still do LASIK and never do smile on them, um, mixed astic mats and things like that. Hyperopic smile is not, I should say, hyperopic relax is not great. That's why augmentation procedures would be the way to go. So long answer to your question is, it will catch, but in the United States, five years from now, ask me, I would still say we're still making, a, we're still paying for our mortgages with LASIK than SMILE. Mm -hmm. so, couple, yeah, a couple of comments from Dr. Mifflin. Do you want to read it? Okay. I've got to read. Basically, first comment was very interesting observation. Borrow the microphone here for a second about these important physical and optical characteristics of eyes. 
and their implications for clinical optics and especially surgical interventions. That was point one. Point two, a little longer. Uh, Dodge and Moshefar's work illustrates the importance of measuring and understanding the smaller, less obvious optical factors and interactions. <clears throat> measuring and tracking outcomes and satisfaction leads to improvement of techniques and patient satisfaction. If you weren't motivated to teach your patients or to teach your refractive or cataract patient well with regard to imprecision or variability in outcomes, you should be now. Are there other questions, comments? Otherwise, thank you so much. And I also want to thank Mark Mifflin for listening to my talk. <laughs>